Hello, welcome everyone to Transforming Assessment webinar series and today we're very pleased to be able to welcome John Dermo from the University of Bradford in the UK. John is from the Centre for Educational Development at Bradford and he's an advisor on technology enhanced assessment which of course is the thing that we talk about in our webinar series about e-assessment. So we're very much looking forward to John's presentation tonight which will be about the innovative um, e-assessment facilities that are at Bradford and how Bradford's been newly, uh, using those facilities. So John, I will hand over now to you for the presentation. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, so good morning everyone from Yorkshire. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'd like to talk today about um, developing spaces for e-assessment and you see there a photograph of the e-assessment suite that we've been developing over the past few years um, alongside some other facilities at the University of Bradford. Um, so this, these are the various areas I'd like to look at. Please if you do have any questions as um, as Jeff said there in the introduction, please do write them in the chat box or put your hand up and I'd be glad to, to discuss things as we go along. And I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on the text chat as best I can, but I'm sure that Jeff and Matthew will, will help me with that. So the areas I want to, um, to discuss and look at today is, is all around the, the facility, the room that I showed you just there, but also I'd like to give you um, the background to this, so the, the systems that go around this room and help support e-assessment more generally, also why we did this, and then after I've talked specifically about the, the journey that we went on in developing this facility and the journey that we're still going on, um, I, I'd like to look at some specific examples of how the room is being used in um, uh, some of the more interesting ways in which it's being used. Okay, now I'll just turn the video off at this point because I'm told that it um, will get better bandwidth. Okay. Um, so just to give a bit of background to this, um, it all started back in 2007 when the University of Bradford got some funding from the, um, the English Funding Council and our Higher Education Academy to um, we didn't have the room at this point. We were still using um, we were still using our standards of more traditional PC clusters. And what we wanted to do, we felt there was a demand, a growing demand for e-assessment. We knew that the demand was there, but we we weren't uh, we we wanted to make sure that we had um, the the support processes in place to enable this to happen. So it all started with this, this project called the, um, the Pathfinder project back in 2007. And then partly overlapping with that, there was another project where we got some funding from JISC to um, main, the, the largest part of this was to actually put together the room and really capitalize on the support processes which um, were already developing. So. In this project, we actually were able to identify the room, um, earmark the room specifically as an e-assessment suite, um, try out various options, and set up the set up the kit in there. Now, initially, a large driver was for summative assessment. We knew that the the room would be used during examination periods for high stakes sit down, invigilated um, assessments. But we knew that there was no point build, um, building a room which was only going to be used for a handful of weeks a year. So we needed something which would be flexible enough to be used all year round in a variety of ways for self-access to students, um, for teaching, but also for formative assessments. 
um, which could take place throughout the course, or maybe low stakes um, the assessments which would take place at various um, various stages within the program. So flexibility was very important in, in putting together this room. So why why did we do it? Well I've already mentioned that we you know, we'd already had lots of people interested in this, um, lots of people, particularly in summative assessment, and to a lesser extent um, for more formative um, work. And this all linked in very closely with very strategic initiatives that were going on at the university at the time. So we'd, um, we were midway through the university's e-strategy back then, and that was instrumental in, alongside the external funding in setting up um, all the systems to make this happen. And it all links in with um, the corporate strategies of the university and also the more academic side, the teaching and learning strategy and academic and curriculum frameworks coming out of that. Um, we were also, even though I said before that it was, um, it was initially developed with the summative assessment in, in mind primarily. Uh, we were also very aware of, um, as, as all 18 institutions are, of, of the student voice and the messages that were coming out of the National Student Survey that they were, there was clear interest amongst the student body for more innovative forms of assessment and assessment which can um, um, provide um, varied forms of feedback. And this goes hand in hand with the general increased use of e-learning, so the growth of the VOE and the introduction of other tools like e-portfolios and, and so on. And um, coming, uh, building on what I said before, the student expectations were very important because we're very aware that student expectations have radically changed. Um, certainly in the United Kingdom, certainly in England, and I'm sure this is reflected globally, that we've seen unprecedented change in, in higher education. Um, learners are approaching higher education with very different expectations and assumptions. The, the kind of student body that we have now um, in higher education is, is much more varied than perhaps it used to be. And certainly in England we have the issue of student fees where um, you've probably heard that as of this academic year that we're just starting now, um, students are paying higher fees or will have to pay back higher fees than they have ever have done before. And there's lots of discussion in the sector about how this, how this will impact on um, students' expectations and the role of the student voice in, in what goes on. And this is linked to um, to various ev various examples of evidence which are reported now in the literature, and a good example of this is the the NUS National Union of Students document, which came out a couple of years ago. Um, it's a very interesting um, take on on what students would want from assessment, um, and certainly looking at the ten examples that um, well the, the ten principles rather that you can see listed there, that this is far from the traditional assessment experience which um, um, which we, you know, we're all too aware of in the higher education sector with the emphasis on assessment for learning, formative feedback um, and the fact that assessment should be ongoing throughout the course and the role of peer assessment in this and the idea of dialogic assessment. So it's, it's very interesting that, that there is this demand coming from students and this, this certainly all fits in with um, our, our vision at the University of Bradford about, what, about teaching and learning. So these projects um, which have really been running for the last five years or so, and whilst the external funding has, has finished, these now um, are sustained um, with we carry on supported internally. Um, we've been able to develop various things to support this um, this e assessment facility that we've built. So, dedicated support. We were able to have a dedicated person, which 
um, to date has been myself supporting e-assessments specifically. Previously, these these were covered in a, a broader e-learning technology enhanced learning remit, um, but in the reality of it, often the VLE took precedence, and the um, it wasn't possible to devote as much energy as is required to really get the assessment started. We've also been looking at integrating our systems much better, so getting uh, e-assessment systems that communicate with the VLE, also working towards integrating systems with, um, for example, e-marking, um, e-submission systems, and also moving towards integrating with the student record system. Um, also very important in this, and I'll come back to this later, um, is the importance of the human element in in all these processes. It's very easy to um, to focus primarily on the technologies and making sure that the hardware and the software works, but um, but often there are risks atta attached with um, communication in particular, and um, there are many examples where that it, it, the software is working fine, but it's actually it's sort of, um, workflow models feeling that. Um, where things fall between the cracks, where it's very important to have a, a clear workflow to identify individual roles in this process, who does what when things go wrong, who to communicate with, who to contact, and so on. Um, and, um, that's an, a separate battle quite apart from the, making sure the systems work. It was important for us to have approved policies to make sure that e-assessment was regarded with as much rigor and um, thoroughness as paper-based assessment was, and so we could assure the quality and make sure that we were, we were doing it all right. Uh, so we have, as part of the, the Pathfinder project I referred to earlier, we were able to establish a, um, well, what was then called a computer computer-aided assessment policy, which went, went, um, sat alongside the university's assessment um, policies um, to give it more official standing. That, that was a very important part of it. Also training um, in various formats um, that was set up around this. And then last, but certainly by no means least, the, act, the, the space itself um, was really the, the disk from the project which really brought this together and enabled us to really um, move forward. So to move specific, specifically now onto, onto the room. Um, so first of all, we wanted to build a, a new room. So it wasn't an upgrade of an existing facility. It was a, a room which used to be a, a refectory, in fact, which we which had moved to another another location in the building. So we had this large, um, rather unusually shaped room, which we could um, try to use. Well, um, there were various. What, you, what you're looking at now is is one of the many um, architects' plans which were presented. This is the one we actually went with, and we gave the architect a brief to try to fulfill various things. Um, first of all, we had to make sure that it was compliant with all the, um, the necessary um, regulations in terms of access and space between tables and um, distance from monitors and, and all those things. Um, also, we wanted to make sure that the, uh, well, we want, basically we wanted to get as many people in there as we possibly could. Um, within those limitations. In the top left-hand corner, you can see a, a sort of boxed-off area, which is, um, you'll see when I show you a photograph in a minute, this is an actually a glassed-off area with some seats where students can sit to have extra time, so they're not disturbed when the main body of the room leaves. Um, so that, that was part of the part of the design as well. Also, we want, we instructed the architect to try and give a more flexible, a, 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 dif a different layout. We really didn't want to have a, a just banks of seats in rows. During this project, we, we looked 
we spent quite a lot of time contacting other institutions, trying to find other examples of different layouts. And it was quite interesting, actually, that we discovered whilst we were doing this that really very little had been done on this. There had been quite a bit of work on teaching spaces, but really very little on assessment spaces. So a lot of the places that we contacted, even places that had built things quite recently, had still gone for this traditional rows of computers, um, lots of parallel rows, which we found from the existing facilities that we had before, we had, I think the largest room we had was about 70, 75 with, um, with seats in rows. So it was very efficient for getting large numbers in a, in a rectangular space. But um, it wasn't particularly easy to invigilate. Um, I had, you know, I wondered about how easy it would be to see other screens because whilst you might be within the um, the official minimum distance between seats, you know you are surrounded by um, you're surrounded by other monitors. Um, also, we found with the other room we had before that we, there were certain parts of the room we couldn't use because invigilators couldn't get round the, because there were seats facing back to the wall. So um, it wasn't a it wasn't a very efficient way of doing it. So we wanted a more flexible layout. We wanted a layout which would enable, um, it would be a more pleasant space to work in. It would be a, a place that people would want to come and, and work on their own, and maybe even a teaching space. I mentioned before that we were rather hampered by the shape of the room, because although this, this is, appears in a square box, the the bottom right hand corner, the sort of triangle there, that's actually outside. So it, it was a rather unusual space. So we, we, it w wouldn't have been easy to have got some parallel rows in here anyway. Um, so what we ended up with was, after looking at the, at the various plans from the architect, this is the one we chose. And what we have here is 99 seats. So they're all, what, what you can see here is they're all in groups of three, sitting, facing back to back. You'll see on the photograph that there's sort of little low partitions in between each one. And then in the top right hand corner, there's a, what's actually a sort of raised level where the hundred seat is. Now, normally, um, normally uh, an, an invigilator would be there, or maybe a technician, or maybe myself, in the, um, um, uh, sat up there. It could actually be used by the um, by, as a hundred seat for students, although we've we've never actually had to do that. Um, so that's that's the layout of the room. Let me show you the the room itself, so you get a better idea of it here. So I hope you can see um, in the towards the back the, the glassed off area there. So this is the extra time area where we have 15 seats. So that's five groups of five groups of three. So you see from the one at the front how the three work back to back, and then you have the the partition, which certainly um, would, you know, prevents you seeing part of what the Yes, they, thank you for that. That's the, the glass off area. Uh, so that's the extra time area with sliding glass doors. Um, there is a, um, a speaker system in the main room and in the ex extra time room, which is operated from the in the right hand corner. You can you can just about see in this rather strange fish eye lens photograph. Um, I think there were two people stood in the, the far right hand corner. That's the raised area where there's a sort of microphone and we have a wireless microphone as well so the invigilator can um, can give instructions and you can turn off the two rooms so you could talk to the main room or just the extra time room and there is a bit of a meeting between the two but at least it, it minimizes disruption. So one of the things we were aware of clearly because security is very important for high stakes summative assessment we were really aware of sort of lines of sight, and if you imagine that you were sitting at this um, 
of this desk. I mean, where this photograph is taken from rather higher up, so you will be a bit lower down. But whilst you can see various screens in the distance, it's not actually possible to um, to see what's written on those screens. And certainly, having used this room now for about three years, um, we've never had any evidence of of anyone being able to actually you know, copy off somebody else's screen. So in terms of security, it's um, um, we've been very pleased with how that's gone. Um, I don't know whether it, you really get a, an idea of this from the um, from this photograph, but the um, there are many windows in this room. The opposite wall there is just a bank of windows. You can't see it off the picture, but the side wall on the other side is also windows, which is good for um, it makes it a light. Um, quite pleasant um, space to work in. Uh, one of the downsides is there is actually not really a, a visible wall where we could put a projector screen. So the, the idea of, of using this room for teaching, um, people found various solutions to this, either sort of, um, smart boards on wheels or um, even put the showing stuff on the monitors rather than um, using a screen. But that, that's 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 one of the challenges we've we've been working with with this room. Um, also, I should say something about the um, well, well. We'll actually we'll return to the room a bit later on. I should say something about the, the space as well. Whenever I go in there, I. Um, I'm quite surprised how much space there is there, and I know there have to be minimum distances between the tables. And I often think, you know, we got a, we got 99 plus one. We had 100. We have 100 seats in here. Um, there's so much space in here. Surely we could have got another 10 in here. Um, but uh, but because of wheelchair access and the regulations, um, we were assured that whilst there appears to be a lot of space, 100 was the most that we could we could actually get in there. And interestingly, the architect also said that he, when drawing up plans, he did try to see how many he could get in just by putting them in parallel banks. Well, largely because of the sort of unusual shape of the room. He said he could, it would only have, you could only have squeezed in two or three more anyway. So what we've benefited by having this, um, this more open space um, and I think more appealing space has um, really, you know, we didn't lose much in terms of actual seats in the room. I should say something about the about the systems that that sit behind this because they're they're quite important about um, how it enables us to do what we can do. Because what you're looking at here, this this um, computer here on the, the front desk, on all the desks, isn't a PC. I mean, there's no, um, there's no box with that. That is uh, a Sunray thin client terminal. So this is, a, this is a terminal, and maybe you can see at the front there's a, a little slot just below the monitor where you can put a smart card in there. The, so these are terminals connected to virtual desktops on servers. Now this this slide was drawn up by one of my colleagues in um, IT services, and I'll, I'll do my best to to explain how it works. Um, but um, maybe some of the more technical-minded among you will understand this better than I do. But basically, what happens is each terminal is connected to. Um, a group, one of a group of virtual desktops on the server. And what we do is, for an assessment, we associate a certain group of virtual desktops. So we'll have 100, <coughs> if we're using just this main room, we'll have 100 plus some extras spare. Uh, and these will be allocated um, upon demand as the students log into each terminal. Now. We also use some software called AppSense, which has been um, very useful to us. But the name of the software is there on the slide. What AppSense enables us to do, and this is very important, is, is to help in the imaging process. Because before, these pro before this room was, um, was built and we were delivering um, 
we're delivering the assessments on the on our PC clusters. We found that imaging was a problem. Uh, yes, we could deliver assessments as a link um, from from the virtual learning environment, for example, but we wanted something more secure. And if we where the student didn't have access to a full browser, for example, but just the assessment. So I'm talking about summative assessments here. Um, the um, and, and we found that to, to re-image the whole room for an individual assessment and all the work that was was involved in changing the image before and then changing the image afterwards. It simply wasn't practical to do on any anything like the scale that we had in mind. So what we wanted was something um, much more flexible, something which could be done there and then and didn't require booking rooms up for hours before and after. So AppSense, what this software does is it enables you to turn off certain parts of applications, so this um, or the operating system even, so so we can we deliver windows, but with everything invisible. So all the student sees is the the start button, um, plus a blank desktop with um, a single icon on it. And then when they launch the browser, that's stripped down, so there's no address bar, no back button, no refresh button. So doing it this way, this enabled us to deliver assessments without the need for certain things like um, Responder's secure browser or lockdown browser or um, question mark secure browser or some of the other alternatives. We could handle it this way. Um, so, the, so all the student would get was what you wanted them to get. So you could do it. You could. Um, so we had assessments where students would have a, a doc, a PDF to read alongside the assessment, or maybe a spreadsheet to use. Or sometimes we have had a, another browser window available for them where, where necessary. Um, and this, so, so certainly for. for Summative assessments. This has this has been good, but also for formative assessments because it enables you to um, to switch the configuration much more easily as well. So you can set up the configuration in advance, and it's simply a matter of um, um, by using the virtual desktops. We simply now, when the students um, access one of the thin client terminals, it takes them to the assessment image. Um, rather than a standard um, full Windows student login. Um, I should also say a word about the, the smart cards. I mentioned before that the Sunray terminals have small slots for a, a sort of credit card size smart cards to go in. So what this enables you to do is, if, if without the card, when the student logs into the terminal, it will, we have it now set up that it, it goes to a full um, a full student login, but with the card, this can um, you can use the card either to associate the card with a specific assessment, or you could in, you could uh, associate the card with a specific person. So you put the card in, and you get you get the um, desktop that you need. At the moment, we're not quite, we're working towards the idea of of having a card associated with the student, but for now what we're doing is, is um, associating the cards with um, different assessments. So what you could have is, and that's why we have the colored shapes there, the green triangle and the blue circle, have different cards associated with different assessments, so you could actually have different images running in the room at the same time. Um, and and this, this has worked very well. Um, the, Using the thin clients has enabled us to to deliver the assessments more, um, to change images more quickly, and just just to be more flexible. So, we, it's now at the situation where, so long as the setup is done in advance, um, creating the the um, the virtual desktops with the the correct assessment image on it, that can be set up in advance, and all the setup that's required in the room is walking around and putting a card in each of the machines. So that, that's been a, a big step forward. Um, so just to look at some of the benefits that, that doing that doing it this way, um, so the room that 
that we have and the setup that we have. So I've already mentioned the re-imaging um, re software is now much quicker. And it could be for exams, it could be for formative assessments because you might want to um, you might want to deliver an assessment during the course, which might be low stakes, formative or formative, but from a um, not from a, a full student image, just from a stripped down image, if you like. So that we use that as well. Um, I've said it's easier to control what's going on using AppSense, and I've mentioned the cards as well. This is particularly useful for us in um, uh, during reset periods, during supplementary assessment periods, where you have smaller numbers. We find normally during um, large assessment settings that um, you know it, it's not a question of um, it, it's not a question of how many sittings can we get in the room. It's more you know how many rooms will we need to to accommodate some of the larger. Um, some of the larger modules, and this is, you know, this is one of the things I want to go on to discuss because clearly the kind of modules that are attracted to um, e assessment in the first place are, are often the very large modules, which might be as, as much as you know, in excess of 300 students. Um, so, you know, how do you manage that when your, your capacity is um, is 100 or or 90, allowing for um, for 10 percent extra uh, in the room. So that, that's that's another issue that, that we'll come on to later. But I just thought I'd, I'd flag that one up now. But yes, I was saying about um, about supplementary assessments, where we have reset um, assessments where you might have a handful of students re resitting uh, an online exam which has to be taken online for, because the supplementary assessment needs to be equivalent to the first assessment, yet it's, it wouldn't be practical to, to have a handful of students in a room for 100. So it, we can now have multiple exams going on at the same place. Um, yes, in vigilation, it's one of the benefits is that um, feedback from the invigilators, and we used to have specialist invigilators who were um, hired in to um, to do this. And more recently, they've been supported by invigilators from the academic departments. Um, but the feedback from these invigilators has been um, very positive indeed. Um, they're very happy that it compared to the how it was before, trying to manage the assessments on a a full um, in the old PC rooms on a full student um, desktop. It's they certainly feel it's much more secure, and they they trust the system, which is is very good. I should say something about the invigilators actually, because um, we've been very keen to make sure that we do wherever possible have specialist e assessment invigilators to manage this. Because whilst a fair amount of invigilation or proctoring, I believe it's called in certain parts of the world, um, is carried out um, by members of academic staff from the departments delivering the exam uh, on paper, for e assessment, because it's slightly different, it's slightly more specialised, it's slightly unfamiliar for certain people. We wanted to make sure that we that we do have um, trained, um, experienced e-assessment invigilators on the high stakes assessments, summative assessments. Uh, some feedback we received that the room was easier to find. I mean, the previous rooms we had were generally um, in the um, the basement of the IT building, this one is in the main um, Richmond building on the top floor. It's um, it's certainly more accessible, um, and um, we definitely think it's a, a more pleasant environment. Um, and certainly the windows, the the light that, that we get in there is is part of that. Um, and because of the the glassed off area I mentioned before, it's it, it is easier to manage the the extra time students, which was um, quite a challenge when you didn't have a, a a glassed off area like that. It meant you had to have another room and more invigilators. And we do we do have um, invigilation specifically in that glassed off room. Um, 
just because, partly because of the, 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 the speakers are isolated in the different rooms. Um, what's the train? I see in the chat window, what's the training required for specialist e assessment invigilators? That's a, that's a good question. Um, really, it was no more than sitting down with them and showing them um, the process that was involved, letting them see for themselves um, firsthand, even setting it up so they could log in for themselves and experience it as a student and see see what would actually happen in the room. Being very careful to show all the different steps involved um, and not assuming any prior knowledge about logging in, explaining the difference between um, the uh, logging onto the network and then um, logging onto the assessment later on. Um, again, another good question, are the invigilators expected to sort out technical problems? No, we have um, for high stakes summative assessment, uh, this is part of the, um, the CAA policy that was um, drawn up for computer-aided computer assessment. Um, there is support provided by IT services, um, especially at the beginning and end of, um, of high stakes summative assessment. So there will be somebody on hand to sort out any issues. We know from experience that things, that where unusual things happen, it, it often is at the beginning and the end. I like to make sure where possible that I am I there in the room in person, um, although um, as, as confidence grows in the systems and people sort of begin to trust them a bit more, um, we're hoping to move to a situation where it will be, it will be enough to be contactable. Um, I'll come back to other questions a bit later. Um, I think there are a couple more things specifically about the room I want to look at for now. Um, so if somebody could um, remind me about, about other questions I haven't addressed, we'll deal with those in a bit. Um, all right. So the room was actually finished in January 2009. It was over, it was, I think it was, Christmas 2008 when it was was finally finished and we, we used it for the first time for a summative assessment in our examination period in, in January 2009. Um, so it was in that January period it was just used on a handful of, of modules to, to make sure that the system was um, was behaving as, as we expected. Since then, it um, usage has grown gradually over over the years, and it's it's been good that the, the growth has been quite scalable and manageable. Um, you know, I and others are you know are concerned. What happens if suddenly everyone comes forward and says we want to do it this way? Um, but that, so far, that hasn't been the case. It, uh, we, we, you know, from semester to semester, we'll have a few more modules coming on each time. So we have um, two, two and a half thousand different students um, used our e-assessment room uh, in the in the last academic year, 11-12. Um, the University of Bradford is a relatively small higher education institution. I think we have about 11,000 um, students. So whilst um, you know, we can't say that you know, most students are using this, certainly um, getting on for a quarter of our students have experienced the room. That would be either for formative or summative assessment. Um, and it's used whilst it's used quite a lot in um, areas such within our um, School of Life Sciences. Um, it's used quite a lot in um, biomedical sciences, optometry, pharmacy, clinical science, that kind of thing. Um, also, but it's also used across a range of subject areas from across all our academic schools, um, just primarily um, life sciences. 
And there are a couple of quotes there from, from the early days. This is back from 2009, when um, an associate dean teaching and learning, you know, the reaction was that we'd need another cluster like this. This is a very interesting question, because, as I said before, what, you, what do you do when the, the capacity of the room is 100 and you have 300 students? Do you build another room and another one? Um, and I think that you know that is one of the one of the main challenges that we have to think about. Um, my own personal opinion is that it's not necessarily going to be economical to have larger and larger rooms. I think what we need is more flexible solutions, and perhaps the e assessment cluster of the future won't you know won't look like what we've got here. It certainly suits our purposes now. Um, but perhaps you know the e assessment room of the future will will enable students to bring iPads in, whether they're provided by the institution or the students are bringing in their own device. Again, there are, there are issues around both of those. Um, I think also more flexible practice in in assessment scheduling. I mean, there is an argument that suggests that. By having large rooms and single um, sitting assessments like this um, is, you know, uh, is going back to the old ways. We're, we're drawing here upon traditional modes of assessment. Perhaps instead we should be looking at more flexible modes of delivery, where it's not necessary for everyone to sit down at the same time in the room. Maybe we we can be more imaginative in the way that we deliver our assessments. So we won't need bigger rooms. We just need to manage the the assessments in more in a smarter way. Um, what the way at present that we deal with the large modules um, varies from situation to situation. Um, for example, in certain situations, it isn't a problem for the the course team to have multiple sittings. They're happy to draw on a bank of questions, so we'll have a large. Um, a large bank of questions um, sitting behind this, and students to um, receive a randomised version of that, um, and through um, careful item analysis, we're able to guarantee the, um, the levels of difficulty of the different um, the different parts of the bank to assure that students are getting a fair a fair um, attempt. And the, the, the various versions of, of comparable difficulty. So that way, what, in that situation, of course, you can have as many sittings as you like, um, and uh, it, it isn't. You don't need to keep the students in academic isolation. However, there are there are programs where that simply isn't an option for um, for a variety of reasons, and what we have to do is divide split it up into um, more than one group. One thing that we, we have used successfully is by having back-to-back -back sittings. So we have um, worked closely with the university examinations office to make sure that we schedule assessments back-to-back. -back. But because of the, the layout of the floor where our reassessment room is, it works very well that there's a, there's a staircase coming up to it on one side and then a landing going off on the other. So with just a couple of invigilators, you can make sure that the second sitting are um, coming one way and the first sitting go the other way. Normally, we send the, the first sitting um, away across the landing and then the second sitting is waiting on the floor below and they come up and that way we can prevent um, we can prevent collaboration between the, the two groups, and it effectively it doubles our capacity. So from from being 90 capacity, we immediately double that to um, 280, and, and that and that's worked very well. But we have modules which are larger than that, and once you get into the third sitting, then um, either you have a randomised bank or you have to have academic isolation, and we have recently started doing that. Um, there isn't really a culture of um, keeping students in holding rooms um, for exams at the university, but this is this is something we're beginning to explore, and um, clearly that's 
you know, that's one of the, the ways of dealing with large modules. <coughs> and the, um, we, we find that a lot of modules are within, uh, say, between 100 and 200. So that will cover that will cover many of the cases that, that we have. Um, but ideally, we would you know, we would like to get them in. We want to, do, or as I said before, move towards the more flexible assessment practices that would solve this problem. Um, so since the end of the, the specific externally funded projects I mentioned, there, you know, there have been further developments. Um, what I haven't mentioned yet is a second room which um, which we were able to develop um, in 2011, I think it was, <laughs> it was completed. Because what happened was that whilst, um, as I said, whilst you know, we have a capacity of 90 to 100, the, there are many modules which are just over that, and it's sort of frustrating to have to have two sittings if you've got 110 students. And it was clear that that it would be very useful to us if we could have another room set up in just the same way with the think tank terminals in it, which could be connected to the same group of virtual desktops. And whilst physically it would be located in another building, um, virtually it's, it's part of the, the same assessment group. So yes, you need to have you need to have a, an invigilator, a human in there, um, but what they're actually doing would be, would be the same experience. So another project, um, uh, another estates development project at the university was um, developing um, the university library and student union area into what is um, now known as Student Central. So it's a, it's a refurbishment of the old library and um, of what was the, um, what's called the old communal centre. Um, it was, and as part of this, um, we wanted to have uh, a PC cluster in there, or a, a computer cluster in there, and we discussed the possibility of, of having this, because we still have other, you know, PC clusters around the around the university, and we thought, well, why not? Instead of putting PCs in there, why not put sun rays in there? It could be used as a as a, a drop-in cluster, um, like at, at, um, any other. But at, at where needed, it could be <coughs> it could be used um, for e assessment. So that's what happened. As you see there, it's not a particularly clear photograph, and I hope you can you can make out that it's um, it's the same kind of layout. It's a smaller room with a, a capacity of 30, so it has 10, um, 10 groups of the three, again, laid back to back. Um, and this has been a, a very useful addition for us, and it, it has increased the capacity to, um, well, maximum 130, but we would have probably um, you need to take off 10% um, to allow for that, uh, and this this has brought in it was simplified. It was a whole bunch of modules which were just over 100, and we can um, we can now deal with those without needing a second sitting. Um, So as it says there, we've um, we now use the smart cards um, more efficiently. To begin with, we we didn't use the smart cards. That was a later development. We in the original project brief, it was there as something which we um, which we could potentially do. And since then, we have actually developed this to enable to give us more flexibility, as I said before. It says on the slide single rooms. Yes, we also found that. Um, as well as students who require extra time for summative assessments, there are also students who require um, a single room. So um, we, the university, have a, a corridor um, owned by the psychology department with lots of small um, little rooms with a, a computer in each one, which are used um, where students need to have uh, access to a PC for an exam in a, sing in a single room. So we now use this um, as an extra to um, 
to add on to these assessments, so students who are scheduled for e-assessments in the main room or in the, the extra third smaller room in Student Central um, that need their own room. So they, they go in there. To begin with, we tried putting um, Sunray terminals in the room, which worked very well, but because there was only one network socket in the room and the rooms were also used for PCs in between, um, it was necessary to you know, switch the network cable between, which wasn't ideal. So what the solution that we've now come up with is uh, a development because the the sun rays, because with Oracle company Oracle taking over, um, they have developed, and I think this is probably on on Sun's roadmap as well. But since since we initially set up this project, there is now a PC client, so a bit of software that you can install on a computer which uh, enables you to connect to the virtual desktops and it will, whilst you are running this, it will take over the machine so you're unable to access um, Windows as you normally would. So this is this is our, um, a, a secure way of accessing these virtual desktops via a PC. Um, now it's not it's not the ideal use of resources because you still have a PC um, to have to connect to a virtual desktop. So you, you know, you're not using the PC desktop. So that's not particularly efficient. And one of the benefits of Sunrays is that they are um, they are much cheaper than PCs and um, and allegedly they have a, a longer lifespan than PCs. But uh, but this 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 is a good situation in the. Um, a way of, of making the most of these individual rooms. So we can actually use those rooms as well, so that adds our capacity up to, I think there's a dozen rooms on there. So, it, so you know, we, we might be getting towards 140 students using those rooms as well. And in fact, looking ahead, we're wondering whether this might be the way to go, whether having uh, this client installed on PCs, we could use other existing um, PC clusters to, to add to our um, to add to our capacity. Um, the issue of the smart card remains, however, because of course the standard PC doesn't have the slot where you could put a card, but we're looking into the possibility of having USB card readers, which would be um, which we could plug in and, and access the cards to give us the flexibility there. Um, over the last few years, the various um, academics have collected student feedback on their use of, um, of um, this room, Richmond F42 and Student Central. Um, and 38, and this is just one example. It's um, I haven't picked this because it's particularly positive. This is the typical kind of feedback that we've been getting from students um, when asked what what they think of the room and whether it's appropriate. Um, we've had certainly positive feedback from from students about the the setup in the room. So here they're agreeing that it's appropriately set out. They prefer. There's the tendency to agree that they prefer doing it on computer and summative, other summative exams would work. Um, and certainly in terms of accessibility and ease of reading, um, it's positive there. Um, there is some disagreement. Um, you see that there are, you know, for each of these questions, a few people disagreeing. So it's, it's certainly not unanimous. Um, but, but certainly the, the feedback is very positive. I've spoken a lot about um, about the use of the room for summative assessment because, as, as I said, the, this was you know, sort of prominent in our minds when we were first thinking about this. But at the same time, you know, setting up a room like this, it, it, it's vital that you know it's not it's not a, a white elephant that's used. Um, just during you know, five examination weeks a year, we, we really needed to think that, you know, yes, we had the external funding and that also a lot of investment in the estate from the university. Um, so we had to you know, make a good case for how it would be used all, you know, all semester round. 
And whilst the room is booked by the examinations office for summative, um, for summative the assessment, um, it's managed as a teaching room by our room bookings team during term time. So this um, this could be for one-off assess e assessments, or it increasingly it, it's used for sort of regular. You know, it might be weekly or fortnightly e assessments in there. Um, I'll come on to this in a moment. But managing the, the room bookings has been quite an, an interesting challenge because um, the the room booking systems that are in place are very often set around the you know, the regular weekly slot. You know, if I if I'm lecturing at ten o'clock on Tuesday morning, I will have that room blocked out for um, for the whole semester. But the assessment use often doesn't fit in with that. Often it's you know I I want it at ten o'clock on Tuesday morning, but you know, only on only in weeks five and nine, for example. And how do you manage that when somebody else might want it for the whole time? And it was well, it was always understood that we would pr we would prioritise e assessments um, in this room, but that that poses certain challenges where you um, <clears throat> you might have a somebody who wants to teach in there at a regular slot, and somebody else who wants to use it um, more specifically for e assessment. Um, and there's a clash, so we've had to manage that very carefully and make sure that the e-assessment bookings, wherever possible, get in first, and that way they can be prioritised over the, the block bookings that come later on. Um, <clears throat> so it is used for regular teaching sessions, and, and the rest of the time it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as a self-access cluster for students. And I don't have specific data on 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 use, but certainly from my experience and sort of anecdotal evidence, um, would suggest that the room is is very popular and is is certainly used widely by students. And I think my next slide. Yes, it's specifically about this, about some of the issues around the use of this room by students for um, um, just as a general drop-in computer facility. Um, as I said, there's, there appears to be some, it appears to be in regular use. There's, we've had positive feedback from students. They, they, they like the room. Um, it's a pleasant learning space. We know just from seeing how students work and also from how, how people who teach in this room um, use the room that this layout, as we'd hoped, does encourage um, group work and this, this open layout. I mean, it, it's quite interesting actually, a bit of, um, I don't know whether this is hard evidence or not, but it's very interesting when we go around before examination periods and are preparing the room for the, this, um, when it's block booked by the exams office. We go around and make sure that the room is tidy and uh, that everything's set up right and because some chairs disappear and things, we have to make sure that everything is, is ready. And part of that is, is, um, is cleaning the room and cleaning the monitors. It's quite interesting how many fingerprints there are on the monitor, which I know it's a strange bit of evidence, but it would seem to indicate that people are pointing at things on the screen. And certainly I've seen lots of students sit grouped around one or two of these machines, you know, pointing at the machine and putting a, a fingerprint on the machine. Um, so, yes, I've, I've already mentioned already mentioned that the room is, is block booked during a, a, the exam period and there has I, I and I said that the, the number of summative assessments in here is growing and the number of I would say low stakes summative assessments during the um, semester is also clearly growing. Um, and I said the, the the limitations of the thin clients. Yes it's it's interesting if you've ever tried to log on to a standard sort of Windows student image on a thin client compared to logging on to a, um, a PC, 
it, it doesn't respond as quickly. I mean, this does seem to be a limitation of the of pin clients in general. I think maybe I, I, I don't know the, the internet, the technical details about the, um, the specifications of the virtual desktops, but certainly using something like um, PowerPoint or Microsoft Word, for example, it just doesn't respond as quickly as it does when you're using a um, a decent PC. Yet, the students do use this room, and um, you know it's interesting that that doesn't appear to um, to be a, a challenge. Um, which brings me on to challenges and how to. Um, yeah, the first one there. How, how to manage this resource? It's because it has a multifunctional use, and part of the time it, it's used for exams, part of the time it's used for teaching, part of the time it's it's more like a central PC room. Um, it, it has these diff different roles, which which makes it interesting to to manage. Um, I mentioned before booking the room and how it's been necessary to evolve this sort of um, priority system, whereby we we contact people we know who um, who are interested or might be interested in using the room during the coming semester and say this 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 is the deadline for getting the e assessment bookings in on the understanding that once the um once the regular timetabling is done you'll then um you you then have to fit around other <coughs> other sittings or other you know, other bookings um Another issue is the how to manage security on the room, because there are some uh, automatic doors, two automatic doors, to end, which are sort of behind where this photograph was taken from, where the students enter the room. So we have to manage the locks on those rooms as well, because clearly, your, whilst it's open access for students, students are able to just enter the room without using a, a card or anything, they, it's just open, but during um, assessment periods we need to be able to lock the room. So we work very closely with their states and security to make sure that the permissions on the on the door, because they're electronic automatic doors, um, can be restricted to staff only card access where necessary and open where necessary. And uh, again, this is one of the one of the challenges that we faced along the way. Um, the, the I mean, the, the ownership of the the facility is I mean, it's interesting. It we we have had to manage basically with with multiple ownership and the fact that ownership changes depending on the you know the, the use, which. Um, yeah, which is interesting, and it just and it shows the importance of communication in all of this. Um, challenges about server capacity. Yes, the this I'm talking here about the the behind the scenes resources for the to manage the virtual desktops. Because when we first um, started using this in 2009, um, really we. As far as we know, we were the first institution using this technology in this way. Um, yes, we knew there were many institutions using um, using large numbers of thin clients, but not necessarily for simultaneous logins. Um, I believe at the Sun um, head office they use thin clients, but you know the general patterns of the working day will mean that the the load is, is spread out. So we really had to make sure that the, there was enough server capacity to um, to deal with all everybody logging in. And when we first tested it, it was perfectly clear that um, the estimates that the Sun had provided in the first instance were um, were not enough capacity. And so then um, it was a matter of putting plenty in and then over time sort of scaling it back. And now a few years a few years down the line, I think we've we've arrived at a situation where we know um, 
um, we know what or IT services know what resources to, to devote to this to make it work. Also, one, one new development is that um, previously we used to have a, a smaller set of virtual desktops which would be switched over from PC use to um, exam use where required. Uh, and when the use of these, these facilities was relatively small, that was quite manageable. But now, um, uh, and uh, uh, but now that, that we found that the, the use is the demand is far higher and spread out throughout the semester, there's a lot more switching between the, by putting the cards in and switching over to the other sets. So we now have full sets of virtual desktops for student use, and then separate from that for exam use. So we can immediately switch over from one to the other. And that that was an important lesson to learn. Um, and looking ahead, I mean, one of one of the things which was mentioned in the original um, project brief was to look at the. I mean, a lot of the exams that I should have said this earlier. A lot of the assessments that that are delivered in the room. And I'll show you some some examples in a, in a couple of minutes. Are um, automatically marked assessments, so they're delivered using question mark perception. Um, a combination of automatically marked question type such as um, multiple choice questions, extended matching questions, um, and so on. Um, there is, and I'll come on to this in a minute, there is an increasing interest in sort of developing sort of hybrid exams, a combination of multiple choice automatically marked questions with open ended human marked questions um, so that the, the system will question mark perception will automatically mark the ones it can and the questions which have to be open-ended questions to cover the higher level um, skills required will then be generated in a spreadsheet and marked by humans later on. So that, that's a move towards this original idea that we had to explore the possibility of using these facilities for, for having word processed essays. Um, it's certainly something I'd be very interested in, in developing, um, and we thought about it a lot, but um, we're still looking forward to, to, to finding um, pilot situations where people are, are interested in, um, in working with this, because I think this would, this would sit nicely alongside developments that are underway at the moment in um, electronic submission and um, electronic marking and electronic feedback, but that's, I think that's one for the future. Um, we're also looking um, carefully at trying to make our different systems and processes fit together. This is a this was a diagram that was developed um, from within IT services during the the GISC funded project, showing um, how our examination timetabling system, Syllabus Plus, Question Mark Perception, the e-assessment software, and SITS, the um, student record system, would fit together with a, um, with a, a core component feeding information between them. Now, this is something which um, even a couple of years down the line, this is something we're, we're still working towards. Um, but the idea is that what we want to do is to um, make the, the loop more efficient. So the idea of scheduling the assessment, delivering the assessment, marking the assessment, sending the grades to the student record system becomes efficient. I, I, I hesitate to say automated because I, I think you do need a human element in that just to, as, a, as a final check. But so again, this is one we're, we're still moving towards. Yes, and that, that bit, that fits in well with this next slide about the importance of the, the human processes. I've talked a lot about the room and the, the hardware and the virtual desktops that, um, that sit behind that, but there are a lot of people involved. And this, this has been, um, this goes back to the initial um, Pathfinder project. Um, the, I, I tried to come up with a list, and this is by no means exhaustive, and apologies if I've missed any of the other key key stakeholder groups off here, but um, 
once you start looking at um, the assessment and it, you know, it has its tentacles reach out into all parts of the um, of the institution and these people will have different roles to play at different times and it's it's vital to to establish who does what and where I, earlier on I mentioned workflows but where um, um, <clears throat> where, the, where these things fit together and how. Um, so, to conclude this part, because I'm going to go on to look at some examples of how it's used, we've learnt a lot from this journey. Um, you know, it's it's been about five years since since we first really set out dealing with e-assessment in earnest and yes of course getting the technology systems are important but it's it's not just the technology it's very often it's communication and also data is, is very important for example um, earlier on I mentioned integrating systems you, know, you need to make sure that the um, you have a, a single point of trust in your system so that um, so that the the data can move around from one system to the other um, and I, I mentioned before that we, we can only automate this up to a point um, that humans have to play a part in in assessment as well right so um I just want to show you some examples of how it's been used. Um, I can't claim that these are typical of the majority um, of, of examples of how this room is used. Uh, very often, particularly for summative assessments, the, the room is used for um, multiple choice assessments, maybe with images inserted in there. Um, it's certainly been very, um, actually just before I move on to this slide, uh, I'll say, say a few words about this, that the, it's been very useful for, for example, in the School of Optometry, um, one of the drivers for them to, to get involved with on-screen online testing was that they, it, it was prohibitively ex expensive for them to produce the high, high resolution, high quality colour images that they needed in printed examination booklets. Um, and what what was actually very difficult and expensive to do on paper was actually quite easy to do on screen. So that that has been one driver. Um, yes, there has been some um, some innovation as well, uh, moving away over a period of time from the, the standard sort of MCQ multiple response type of question towards more dr use of drag and drop questions where you might have a, a background image and, and dragging labels to um, to identify things on, the, on a, a diagram. The use of extended matching questions um, has been has been very good as well. But um, I want to show you some some examples of things where they've taken it perhaps a, a step further. And typically these are these are examples from um, mid-term assessments or well, no, assessments that take place during the term. Some are, I would say, low-stake summative. Some are, are genuinely more formative. This first example is from um, a module in the Department of Biomedical Sciences, which is, I believe, is actually a, a, a postgraduate module um, where the students answer questions about um, genetics and the instructor was very keen to use uh, this authentic genetic research tool called the BLAST tool. So this is a web-based tool where you can paste in genetic information which is sort of strings of letters and run, you click on the BLAST button and, and the tool will process this and then give you some information about what what the system says about this particular string of genetic information and it will give you um, various probabilities of what this might mean. So the instructor wanted the students to be able to use this tool because this is a genuine real-life tool that um, experts in this field use and 
ask questions about their use of the tool. So we set this up so that it could um, deliver the multiple choice questions in one window and then in another window let them um, use the tool. So they'd copy the information from the question, so we had to do special templates to enable the right click, copy and paste, and then paste it into the um, into the tool and then answer the questions based on that. Um, so it's a real life task. It's certainly more if, if we think in terms of sort of blues taxonomy of the cognitive domain, we're looking more at applying knowledge and understanding to a real life context rather than um, just um, uh, testing knowledge. Um, and it was this was a very good way because it was quite a large number of students in the module to uh, I think it was one of those where we had to do the back to back sittings. So it was I think about hundred and 130. We started doing this before we had the, the extra room. Um, so that that's um, one interesting way in which the room was used. What I'm showing you here in this slide is uh, the practice. This is the, the formative test. So we got all the students in the room during the um, during a teaching period, and the students had to go on it. Um, they also had access to another practice test um, via the BLE, but we, we got them in the room um, to practice it. And then there was a summative test um, later on in the examination period, in the, um, which used the same tool in the same way. Um, the, the previous example from biomedical sciences used the word formative, but I think the example here is what I would consider to be more genuinely formative from um, our School of Medical Sciences where the, the students were given a practice test about, um, I think it was about two thirds, three quarters of the way through the module to give them some diagnostic feedback on, on their progress throughout the course. So all the students came together into the e-assessment room and um, and sat this on mass and um, this, this is, we've run this a few times over, over the last three years now and to begin with we started giving question by question feedback, so generic feedback on each question with um, quite extensive feedback with um, images and specific feedback on particular distractors to give, yes, generic feedback but um, but automatic feedback to, again, it was uh, on this module about 90 students, so it was a way of getting some kind of feedback to, to large numbers of students. As I said, in the first year we, give it, we did it um, on question by question feedback and we surveyed the students and yes, they liked the experience, but we we felt from the feedback that they were concentrating rather on the individual questions that they'd been asked in the in the formative task rather than thinking about the the understanding that lay behind that. So we experimented the following year with topic based feedback because we use question mark perception, this enables us to bank the questions and give feedback on um certain topic areas. Um, based on their performance on different parts of the bank. So we gave topic-based feedback. The, and students, it was interesting, the students engaged with this much more than they did, um, this is a year later, so it may be accounted for by it, it being a different cohort, but certainly the, level, the quantity of engagement was far greater, I mean, I mean um, several times greater than on the question based feedback um, yet yeah, and we didn't give them question by question question level feedback um, so the students again liked having the feedback and they um, uh, yet they did specifically say they wanted the question level feedback as well so I think maybe the next step is to is to look at ways of giving both but as part of this it's also interesting that we, we did quite a lot of detailed um, um, analysis of the data from this, and this, this is written up elsewhere. Perhaps I can send a link to this later. Um, the, 
uh, we did work into looking at levels of engagement by the students and, and progress made. And we found actually that students, because we were given the formative assessment, that there was then subsequently uh, uh, a summative assessment also in the same room. And we could measure the progress that had been made in between times. And we found the students who'd engaged with um, um, with these formative assessments more because they were they were shown first of all in the room but also had access to them later uh, as many times as they wanted by the BLE. Uh, students who engaged with that more tended to do better on the on the final exam. Now we would never argue that cause and effect here. Um, there are so many other variables, but. Um, and perhaps you might argue that, yes, of course, the better students engaged with this and the better students did better on the final exam. But it, nonetheless, it, it was interesting um, to, to observe that. Um, another example I'd, I'd like to mention is about um, the, the use of the room in the School of Optometry. Um, F42 is the, this e assessment cluster. Um, well, there was an interesting use of the room for case studies, um, which were which were assessed initially as group assessments, students working in groups of five or six um, on a number of different case studies, and then later they then moved on to doing individual case studies, first of all formatively, and then finally individual case studies summatively. So. An interesting way in this uh, was an interesting point of this was the fact that the assessments were set up where the students were given the assessment. It was a case study which was released in various stages, so they get certain information and then certain questions based on that. They'd submit this and then move on. They and then they'd move on to the next scenario where more or the same scenario but with more information added. So part of it was changed, more information was added, and then they have to continually re-diagnose the situation. And they went through I think about ten different stages. It was it was quite a, an elaborate process. And they gradually moved to joint decisions as a group. When they finally submitted it as a group, the um question mark section would then email feedback on how they'd done. Um, part of this would, would be um, multiple choice questions which were automatically marked. Part of it would be open-ended questions where they would get a, a model answer in response. And it started as group work um, and then moved towards individual work. So um, a very interesting use of the facility. And really, this was only possible because of the layout of the room. And I, I went to observe a number of, um, of cases of this happening. It was very interesting. Um, very exciting, I thought, to see the, the way that students were engaging with online assessment as a group. Really, I think this is, there's a lot of potential for this kind of thing. Um, I mentioned earlier on the idea of a hybrid assessment where you have a subject area where, and this is particularly the case in undergraduate, maybe first, second year programs, where yes, there is a certain amount of terminology, there are a certain amount of knowledge that needs to be understood, where it's appropriate to ask, um, you know, knowledge level multiple choice questions, for example. Yet at the same time, there are higher level um, questions which need to be asked to meet the um, learning outcomes. Which, which cannot be dealt with in that way. So there's a growing demand. Again, this is driven by our School of Life Sciences, where um, there will be different parts of the assessment. So the first part is your, your MCQs, and that's marked automatically. The next part are open-ended questions, and we um, these are exported as a, an Excel spreadsheet, and then with um, a, a bit of reformatting. This is then sent to um, um, sent to the instructors to be marked by human. So I think that this could be this could be an interesting way forward as well. And it's it's more efficient use, and it, it kind of helps to get around this idea that you know multiple choice questions. Um, it become I wouldn't say 
that they're limited, but it just becomes very difficult to assess the higher order skills with, with some of the automatic remark question types. We have um, we have looked um, a bit of a, a peer assessment and. This has been used in the room, mostly, to be honest, as a way of just getting the students in, in, in a large room at, at the same time to carry out a peer, a peer assessment. So this, um, this typically is where students are working on collaborative group tasks and need to assess one another's um, performance. So we have done this in our assessment suite, um, but also um, you can do it remotely via the DLE, but sometimes it's good to get it all done. Um, in one go. And then um, one last example, which is from engineering to show a different subject area, was a very interesting way in which um, one of the lecturers was really engaged with um, formative and summative e assessment with using the using the e assessment suite on a regular basis. So over the years it's developed quite a quite an elaborate series of um, formative assessments which take place um, either in, in the e-assessment suite or, um, or via the VLE, and then a series of low-stakes summative assessments which the formatives feed into, culminating in um, a high-stakes a high assessment, summative assessment at the end. Um, and this it's been very interesting to see the different ways in which the assessment and feedback is used. Um, so, for example, we've experimented with models where the students have multiple attempts. At so, gi giving typically question mark perception would give um, the feedback at the end, but, but setting it up in a way where the students get the feedback at the end of each individual question, perhaps um, uh, then giving them a clue if they got it wrong, but that um, requiring that they have a number of attempts and hopefully get it right before they move on to the next question. Um, there's also a case which I don't have a slide for from, bi um, from chemistry where there's a very interesting task where the instructor, it was about molecules and there were in pictures of molecules and or diagrams of molecules, and the students had to identify what what compound these were. And because it was it's the kind of subject area where it's qu it's quite clear what the first part of the the name of the compound will be, you can sort of give quite structured feedback and require the student to get it right before before they move on. Um, okay, so. This is my final slide, just to show you again the two rooms where um, on F42 and then the, the newer, smaller room on the right there. There's a slide here with some, some extra links, but perhaps now, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll leave that up there. And um, ask for, hang on, I've got this one there. Yes, thank you. Any questions? Okay, thanks very much for that, John. That was excellent. And you can see from the lively discussion that was going on in the chat room that uh, it's uh, certainly sparked a lot of interest. Uh, we're probably aware that um, some people may have to leave soon. So, Matthew, I wondered if you could put up the link to the evaluation while we do the questions. Yes, thank you. So, we'll do that. And uh, while people are thinking about their questions or typing in their questions or in fact putting up their hand. Uh, remember that you can click the little hand symbol or we can hand the mic over to you. Uh, so yes, uh, Anne's just asked about the recording. Yes, Matthew will send out a uh, URL to everyone. Uh, you can always get to our recordings by going to the Transforming Assessment website and there's a link on, the, um, on our site. So yeah, if you lose the URL it doesn't matter. Uh, really the only thing you have to remember for this is the Transforming Assessment website. All our information will be up there. So, if you, uh, yeah, Matthew's put up the link there, so if you click on the link in the slide there, that'll take you to the evaluation uh, form and we re really appreciate people filling that out if you could before you uh, head off. Now, please, any questions or comments people would like to make? Any questions for John? 
Yes, can I just say, it's John here, um, that I'm sorry I wasn't able to really follow much of the chat as I was going through that. I, I, I noticed one or two things as we were going by, but I'm afraid you might have to um, summarize that for me if you can. Uh, John, I think we covered a lot of the uh, questions and you did actually answer a few of the direct questions people uh, put in. Much of the chat was uh, just between the participants going backwards and forwards about some of the issues. So that's another nice thing about doing these webinars, of course, is that you can, um, you can have those uh, concurrent conversations as well. Well, I certainly look forward to having a closer look at the discussions in the chat, um, perhaps later. Uh, John, perhaps I, uh, I'll ask you a question, actually, while um, everyone's filling out the survey and thinking up their questions. Uh, has there been much interest in uh, other organisations about using this room? I would have thought if you had a room or rooms like this, that there might be other institutions or neighbouring institutions that might be interested in using it. Because uh, one of the issues, of course, is if they're not used all the time, uh, is it possible um, to you know, outsource these types of rooms for other organisations? Yes, I mean, that's, that's a really good idea. And it, it's certainly something which throughout I've you know, been aware of the, the potential for doing this. but. As yet, this you know this isn't something that we've um, been able to exploit. But certainly, I'd be very interested in in finding out. I mean, there's been a lot clearly been a lot of interest um, generally in the project, but not specifically in the local groups. But we do. There is a college nearby. Um, it would be interesting to to hear from them. And um, I'm not aware what exactly what facilities they have, but perhaps they'd be interested. And, and people have mentioned schools, um, uh, secondary schools, for example, um, but this it hasn't happened yet. Yes, yeah, certainly here in Australia there's been quite a lot of interest in the secondary school sector in doing e-assessments. And the University of Tasmania uh, example that uh, Matthew put up uh, is certainly um, you know, used within the Tasmanian school sector. It was one of the drivers uh, for that. So certainly I think schools would probably be quite interested in these types of facilities. But again, of course, it just depends on the logistics of being able to, you know, for schools to be able to access and use these sorts of resources. That's right. Um, it's, um, you know, Issues of you know logins and as well as the, the practical logistics and you know, being able to get into the room, it's it's clearly much more straightforward once it's, when it's done internally. But it, you know it's a good point, and I'll certainly I'll certainly raise this with colleagues because I think there's there's great potential there. Any comments or questions from uh, our participants? Okay, John, looks like you've covered all of the issues for everyone. Uh, I was just checking to see if, look, see if anyone was typing in any questions, but it doesn't look like uh, they are. So perhaps uh, what we'll do is then uh, finish the formal part of the session and just say, John, thank you very much for your time tonight. Uh, a very stimulating discussion and certainly generated quite a lot of interest. So we really appreciate your time. Uh, I keep saying tonight, sorry, it's tonight here in Australia. Morning, of course, in the UK. Um, so thank you very much for your time, John. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Matthew, we can probably stop the recording now.